Rock music's roots took hold in the 60s. That generation's stars were the ones who influenced the first top 40s with their 45s. They will forever be part of the history of rock and roll. I'm Bob Surratt. You're about to see three legendary hit makers of the 60s and hear the stories behind their songs. Donovan, the Scottish folk rocker whose guitar playing influenced John Lennon. He turned the Beatles on to the Maharishi, or as he called him, the Hurdy Gurdy Man. Gene Pitney. Not only did he have more than 20 singles on the charts, he wrote the rock classics Hello Mary Lou, He's a Rebel, and Rubber Ball. You'll meet Gene Pitney and Donovan shortly. But we'll begin with Leslie Gore. She would become one of the first female singers to write her own songs. Record producer Quincy Jones heard her demo disc of a song about a teenager's independence. He liked the 16-year-old's voice, and the rest, as they say, is history. We went into the studio at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and came out at 5 o'clock on budget, on time, with three songs cut and mixed. Now, that's unheard of today. I read somewhere that originally It's My Party was going to have... Now, I'm not a musician, so I'll use the layman's term, but originally... It was like um, six or seven downbeats before you would begin singing. That's exactly right. And then you listen to the record today, and it's like boom, boom, and you're singing. Klaus Ogerman, who's an absolutely fantastic arranger, did the arrangements to the song. And we ran It's My Party first. And I believe his intro went something like, dum, da, 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 dum, 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 dum. And then I was supposed to start. Quincy immediately came in, and I understood the importance of a producer, and said, too much wasted space. Let's just do bomp bomp. It's my part. And that really taught me a lot about making pop records. It's my party and I cry if I want to. Cry if I want to. Cry if I want to. You would cry too if it happened to you. Can you remember what it was like the first time you heard your first hit, It's My Party, on the radio? I was coming home from school. It was a Friday afternoon. I was driving my own car, living in New Jersey at the time, so I was able to drive. And um, a record went on the air on WINS, which is now all talk. In New York. In New York. And uh, it sounded like my record, but I really wasn't sure. How could you think, even for a second, this isn't me? Because I never knew it was going to be released that quickly. I had no idea. I mean, I just heard it on the radio by chance. The night that we had recorded It's My Party, that afternoon we had recorded, that evening, he had gone to Carnegie Hall because Charles Aznavour was per performing. And Quincy was, uh, I think, vice president in charge of A&R of Mercury. So he was going kind of as a representative to the company. And he was standing on the steps of Carnegie Hall, beautiful, beautiful evening. And Phil Spector jumps out of his limousine and flies up the stairs with the cape and the red lining and the whole thing and says to Quincy, Quincy, I'm cutting a song that's the most incredible thing I've ever cut. The, I'm doing it with the Crystals, who were just coming off of the Do Run Run. And Quincy said, what's the name of the song? And Phil said, it's called It's My Party. So if they didn't act quickly, uh, It's My Party could would have Would have come out with the Crystals, yeah. and you would have been sitting here talking to three women instead of me. Did you ever find out, by the way, was there ever a party where Johnny and Judy had uh, got together? I'm actually still researching this, Bob. Yeah, because we're not sure. There have been so many rumors about these two, you know. I uh, often think if, if, if Judy and Johnny were around today, who would they be? And all I can think is they might be Crystal and Blake Carrington. I frankly thought it was kind of nerdy to put out a sequel. I, um, but the record company was really making all the moves. Here I was, 16, with one record out. They weren't exactly asking me what I thought the next single should be, so I had no input. In 1964, the, the record that you do and you have great success with, now is looked at by some feminists as maybe the first sort of uh, 
you know, rock hit where the woman was saying, I'm not dependent, I'm independent. Two guys wrote the song, which is why I never actually thought of it as a feminist song. I kind of thought of it as a humanist song, but I loved the message. It was something I, that came out of my mouth very easily. said in an interview, anyone who thinks I could retire and buy a house in the south of France is badly mistaken. <laughs> uh, why are we mistaken about this? Because you had seven top 20 singles in, what, a couple of years? And you appear in movies and you're on television. So I think there's this uh, impression that you made a lot of money. In 1967, when Mercury Let Me Go, I was in debt to them to what they claim was $175,000. It took 25 years for me to ever see a penny from Mercury. I didn't see money from Mercury until 1989. That's incredible. And I'm one of the lucky ones. By the way, this is, this is something that uh, I have to ask you. Is it true? What? Is it true that your classic flip, they call it flip hairdo of the 60s, even withstood the winds of Chicago? Oh, it did. As a matter of fact, my body would be parallel to the sidewalk, but my hair was always perfectly configured. Talk about what you've been doing the past 10 or 15 years. Um, I had the good fortune of working with my brother, Michael, on the film Fame, for which we wrote out here on my own. And that was a real good shot in the arm in terms of starting a new writing career. Oh, that rising star to guide me far and shine me home I'm on my own How long do you want to keep performing? Till I get that little house in the south of France. No, I, until I... For real. Exactly. Um, I want to... Because it's the best part of the whole thing. I mean, it's always great to, to talk to people and meet fans and, and, and that, but performing is, is what it's all about. So I think at the point where I don't think I sound good anymore, or I'm too fat to get into my clothes, or I don't know what it'll be, but something will tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, maybe it's enough. 